shout of praise tonight. We raise a mighty voice. We'll never stop praising you, Lord. There will be a On that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall Worship Jesus who is alive. Amen? Uh I'm going to read Luke 24. You ready for this? Let's honor the word of God. Let's honor the word of God. You ready? Luke 24, verse 1 says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, They came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared and they found that the stone had been rolled away. And when they entered, they did not find the body of our Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men standing in dazzling clothes. As the women were terrified, they bowed their faces to the ground and the men said to them this phrase. Are you ready? Why do you seek the living one among the dead? For he is not here. He is risen from the dead. He is still risen today. And for all of eternity, we will worship the Lamb of God who was slain. That is good news. That is really good news. Happy Resurrection Sunday. It's also Baptism Sunday as well. We're going to celebrate the power of not just the cross, but the empty tomb tonight. Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready for resurrection life. 
Get ready for resurrection life.
thankful for the cross. So good. It's baptism Sunday. We got 22 people that are coming out today to get baptized. They've crossed over from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. They've turned away from sin and they're turning fully towards God. Baptism is an outward declaration of an inner reality. It's a prophetic act. You're declaring, I am dead to this world. I renounce the lies, the sin of this world. I am fully alive to please God. And so if these guys have come here, we're going to have some powerful stories. So why don't you guys go ahead and just sit down right where you're at there. And um, we're going to hear some good stuff. All right, are you guys ready? What's your name and why do you want to be baptized? My name is Declan and I want to be baptized because I love Jesus. That's a good one. <laughs> hey, sweetie, what's your name and why do you want to be baptized? My name is Alana Harlan. I am eight years old and I want to be baptized because when I little I love to learn about God and every single week I love going to church and learning about God I love reading the Bible and also I love learning about God so getting baptized i um, will give me another reservation to get to learn about God what's your name and why I want to get baptized uh, my name is Selah um, I guess I'll say, um, I'm 10 years old and, um, um, I've kind of been drawn away basically from God yeah. and, um, it's kind of like I've been caught by those, um, those thoughts that tell you you're unwanted, you're a horrible child, those type of stuff. And I just, um want to come to God and know his thoughts that he thinks of me. Hold on. That's what God thinks about you. <laughs> Your love. 
All those thoughts are dead on the cross. And you're his daughter. And that's what God declares over to you. So we just, we just, we are right there with you, just declaring the devil's, and his voice is dead, and Jesus is alive in you. You're his daughter. Amen. Huh? What's that? She's 10. 10? You're 10? Selah, you're awesome. You're a revivalist. Listen. I see you just pulling the spirit of suicide off of your generation. Yep. You're a, you're a powerful woman of God. The Lord's gonna, he's in your life. Yeah, yeah. You like to draw? Yeah, I do. You do? Yep, keep drawing. God's gonna begin to show you prophetic pictures and you're just gonna begin to draw in your room. It's gonna be awesome. You like rocket ships and space and stuff? Uh, not really. Not really? <laughs> Good, you're not supposed to. Just keep drawing that other stuff you like, all right? <laughs> you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, hi, my name's Josiah, I'm 12 years old, and the reason why I wanna get baptized is because I feel like I've kind of been drifting away from God, and I, I'm kind of starting a new chapter of my life, and I want him to be with me 100% of the time. So good. Come on, man. From this day forward, your old life is dead, and you're alive in Christ to please his heart, baby. That's why you're alive. You're a revivalist. Come on. All right. What's your name and why you want to get baptized? My name is Bryce, and I want to be baptized so that I can have a stronger relationship with Jesus. Come on. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, go ahead. What's your name why you want to get baptized? My name is Jasper, and I want to get baptized because I had an encounter with God um, in December, and he told me um, this is the chapter of my life where I get baptized. So good. Hey, bud, what's your name and why you want to get baptized? My name is Solomon, and I want to get baptized so God can have power over me. <laughs> All right. Yield to Jesus, empowered by the Spirit. Works. What up, boys? What's your names and why you want to get baptized? I'm Johannes. Johannes and I want to get baptized because I want to belong to Jesus. Yeah. My name is David, and I want to be baptized because I want to be filled with Jesus. <laughs> you know, you never know what's happening in kids. I know these, these two kids have been begging their dad, we want to get baptized. God's just moving in their hearts. My name is Chase, and I want to get baptized because in Acts 2, verse 38, um, <laughs> you got a crowd cheering you on. Well, so it goes like, um, oh my gosh. <laughs> Jesus, repent, every one of you. Then Peter said to him, go into, oh my gosh, no, uh, wrong one. Repent and be baptized. Uh, repent and be baptized. In the name of Jesus. Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, and we shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want that gift. <laughs> I think he's in Young Saints, just saying. It's your son. That's your son. All right. Uh, my name is Craig, and I want to get baptized because God has been moving with me and my family so real. I can touch it, and I just want to publicly declare that I want to follow him. God bless you.
My name is May. My name is Hui. Debra King. Okay, it was this morning at um, eight o'clock service. Uh, um, Pastor Bill, something he said really touched me. Um, it was like a, he said, um, when you are born again, um, you lose your right to say that I am just a human. So, so at that time, because uh, my first baptism was 19 years ago, I didn't understand what's born again. But now, after first year of BSSM, I feel I'm ready to be born again. It was the, the eight o'clock service, and then we have our Chinese church service at 10, and this is all our Chinese uh, congregation. And at the service, 10 o'clock, my pastor, Deborah, she had a revelation and, uh, and the vision that uh, we need to be baptized today with the uh, Holy Spirit and the fire. Come on. So here we are, three of us. So, Everybody just shout more. My name is Wu Mei. Um, Why you want to get baptized? Uh, God's grace is sufficient for me. More than what I've asked for. So I want to become a real Christian. Become more intimate with God. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jason. And uh, the reason I want to get baptized is because God loved my family, and uh, God gave me the talent for music, and I want to worship him, and uh, I want to follow Jesus. Thanks. Come on. So you're, you're renouncing the, the world and saying, Jesus, I want to follow you in my music and with my life. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Come on, baby. Come on. Um, my name's Brandy, and um, um, I've been a Christian for a while. I was baptized when I was too young to really know what was going on, and I knew I was going to get baptized again at some point. And um, this last month, um, the Lord miraculously set me free from PTSD. Um, yeah, I've been um, carrying this pain in my body for 30 years, and um, today I'm... Jesus has my grave clothes. I don't need them. <laughs> Uh, my name is Lisa, and I'm a BSSM student, and I want to get baptized because Jesus has changed my life radically, and I just want to see that and celebrate that. Come on. You got a fan club. <laughs> okay, so my name is Yandra. I'm also a first year BSSM student. Um, yeah, I got baptized like 13 years ago and it was kind of out of obligation. I didn't really fully understand what I was doing and I was still living a double life. And coming here, I've had such an inward. Woo! <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> I've had such a radical change that I was like, God, fully consecrated for you and you can have my life and you can do whatever you want to do for your glory and for your kingdom. So that's why I'm getting baptized today. Amen. I am extremely nervous. Let's start by saying that. My name is uh, Carlos Savares. Um, he said he's the way, the truth, and the life. 
I've played around enough with new age darkness to know that that's not the way. And so I'm realizing by surrendering fully to Christ is the only real way to know that he is the truth. never going to be the same again. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and fire. Ooh. Ooh. Fire of God. Just point your hands right here at this guy. <laughs> fire of God, fill him in Jesus' name. Come on, I'm proud of you, man. My name is Jade, and um, hi. <laughs> so I want to get baptized because I just feel like um, I need my life to change, and I want the power of the Holy Spirit behind me and all that I do and say moving forward. So, yeah. Come on, Jade. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Mason Mack, um, and I have just lived the life of a lukewarm Christian uh, of the flesh for 20, to, 20 years. And uh, about two years ago, I discovered, you know, some truth, and, I, and I, I wanted that to be a bigger part of my life. And, but I never fully, fully declared it in any way. And today in church, I was, I was just praying. I was like, Lord, give me something. And he was like, you're supposed to get baptized. And I was like, okay. And then sure enough, two minutes later, you're like, if you want to get baptized, you come tonight. And so I walked out, I went out to my girlfriend and I said, I'm going to get baptized tonight. And she was like, that's awesome. So uh, here I am. You're, you're never going to be the same again. Never going to be the same. Hi, I'm Janine. I'm a student as well. I'm a second year student. <laughs> um, getting rid of shame today. Um, yeah, a long time ago, um, I, I got saved and got baptized and didn't really understand. Maybe I did it that time, but um, wandered off the simplicity of the gospel and that it is a free gift. Mm. and been um, struggling and striving to surrender all and just not having the willingness inside. And, um, yeah, just finally realizing that Jesus is giving me his heart and I, I willingly and joyfully <laughs> give him his heart and trust in his grace to, yeah. So, yeah, and I felt like I meant to do this for a while. So, so good. today's the day. Today is the day. Never the same again. My name is Jesus Galindo, and I'm here because I need to get baptized because I can't keep running from my destiny. And I can't do it alone, and I need God's help. Yeah. You're, for, you're forsaking the world. It's surrendering to Jesus fully. It hits your, he's your destiny. Let's go. Come on. Never the same. Right. Hi, I'm, I'm Doug. I'm Douglas. I wanted to get baptized so I could do God's will and no longer mine. Yeah. Right, could, come on. So good. Why don't you go ahead and stand? We're going to go back into worship. I want to get baptized, so I'm no longer doing my will, but I want to do God's will. That's pretty clear tonight. Maybe you're in this room right now, and 
you've not been fully surrendered to Christ. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus before. Maybe you knew God as a child, but you know right now you're not where you need to be. Religion would tell you, go do a bunch of stuff first and clean yourself up, then you'll be good enough, but that'll only leave you more heavy. Amen? The world says, don't worry about it, just, you know, you have needs. But the, in the kingdom, you come just as you are. And you surrender everything to the Spirit of God. And you let Jesus come be the Lord of your life. Maybe you're in this room and you've got addiction, or maybe you know you've been just lukewarm. God doesn't want you lukewarm. He either wants you cold or hot. There's only one way to be married, and that's hot in love with God. In your marriage and in God. So if you're here right now and you'd say, you know what? I, Maybe you got, you feel like the Lord spoke to you through one of those guys. Listen, if you've been baptized before and you made some mistakes, I'm not telling you, you need to get baptized again. The first time worked, okay? Baptism doesn't save you. It's water. But it's the prophetic act of the declaration, the public declaration to the world. I'm dead to the old life. And I'm now living fully alive in Christ. So maybe that's you right now. And you'd say, you know what? I want to surrender my life to Jesus fully. Do something radical. Get baptized tonight in your clothes. Come right over here. One of these guys will talk to you, and, uh, and we'll make sure you're making that decision with the Lord, and it's going to be awesome. So let's go back into worship tonight. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living home. Hmm. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What a heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory.
God's not dead, he's surely alive, living on the inside, roaring like a lion, my God's not dead, he's surely alive, living on the inside, roaring like a lion, my God's not dead, he's surely alive, roaring
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. Oh, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and was drenched in your voices and sing that together. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah.
King of kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you.
Close your eyes right now. Jesus, we love you. Sing it out. Oh, how we love you. You are the one who hearts adore. Jesus, we There's something about the affection that only we can bring as an individual to His feet. Something beautiful that's happening right now corporately in this house and online. Everybody watching around the world, we're breaking our alabaster jar before Him as a house. But I, I'm just so struck as we sing this song and I think about even that act that we love to celebrate so much in this house that, that Mary, she came with... Uh, an intention. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume. She brought it with intention in her heart because she knew what she was going to do with it. (laughs) She brought an alabaster jar, not just to sit there next to Jesus with. She actually came with something costly that she had bought. She heard where Jesus was and she bought something that mattered to her to find Jesus not to just sit with Him, but to break that thing that was important and valuable and costly to her at His feet. And I just want us, even if it's just a couple of minutes longer, if we could go back in, Pete, if you're able to help us. We're gonna go back in. We've just stepped into this beautiful place of affection and adoration here in this house. Don't be satisfied that the person next to you is breaking their jar. You have something beautiful to break at His feet tonight. And we're just gonna go back, even if it's just another couple of minutes, I want you to lose yourself, lose yourself in affection, in devotion, in love, in passion. Don't worry about the person next to you. Don't worry about how the worship sounds. 
here on the stage. Don't worry about the baptisms that are happening or not happening. Don't worry about the fact that you're here in Redding, California. Just lose yourself at His feet just for a moment. Just begin to allow that love song come up and out of you. Pay attention to the alabaster jar that you have, that you bought, that you need to break at His feet tonight. Come, come before the Christ. Come not just to go through the motions here at church again. Come to break your costly perfume at His feet. Come on, let's go back into this again. Just a moment longer. And I want it to cost you something. Be intentional with this alabaster jar that only you have to break on His feet tonight. Come on.
this Christ that we break our alabaster jar on, that we pour out our costly fragrance upon. It was, as the Scripture says, in preparation for the cross this Easter weekend as we remember the death of our Saviour. We also remember that this Christ those feet so beautifully ministered to had holes in them, had nails driven through them and died in our place. But on this Resurrection Sunday, we remember that this Christ, the story of the cross is just the beginning. The cross is the doorway in to the tomb which was emptied, the stone was rolled away. And this Christ that we minister to, this Christ that we love so much with all of our heart, didn't just stay in the tomb once the stone was rolled away. He made a decision to take off His grave clothes, unwrap His head, any remnant of death he folded up and he left in that tomb and he walked out never to return again and I believe that tonight there's some of us that are tempted to continue to go back to this empty tomb because if you think about the reality of the stone being rolled away Jesus was resurrected he walked out of that tomb but It never says in the Scriptures that the stone rolled back in place. He could have easily made a decision to return back to the tomb of death if He so wished. And I believe there's some of you tonight that you find yourself in patterns of sin and death that you just can't seem to shake. You find it easy to return back to the tomb that you were set free from. And I just really believe that tonight, just even quickly, if you just have enough courage just to say, you know what, Ben, that's me. I, I find myself stuck in patterns of death. I'm, I'm even bound in sin. I find myself at times just doing things that I know that I've been set free from and I keep circling back. I know that He's paid the price for me. I know I've been set free, but for whatever reason, I just keep finding my way back into that tomb, partnering with those clothes, tempted to put them back on again. If that's you, just raise your hand up in the air tonight. I believe that tonight Jesus wants to set you free once and for all from the power of sin and death. If you're around these people, there's lots of people with their hands up. Can we just gather around them? We know what to do, church. Gather around these ones, lay hands on them. And I want you just for the next 30 seconds or so, I want you to pray bold prayers of faith and agreement with the power of the blood of Jesus, the power of the cross, the power of the resurrection and the glorification, ascension of Jesus Christ. I want you just to proclaim the truth of the finished work of Jesus over them. Out loud, keep praying. For 30 seconds or so, just pray, keep praying, keep praying. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus, we understand Your victory on that day that we remember here this Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday. We remember that death, hell and the grave was destroyed by the Son of the living God. That not only did You rise again, but You ascended into heaven and You're currently seated at the right hand of the Father, full of victory, full of glory, full of power. Right now, Jesus, we align ourselves with everything that You have purchased and paid for for us. Right now, we break agreement in any area of our life where we are tempted to return back to that which You have set us free from. Jesus, we repent. We say, please forgive us for any place where we've gone back into a tomb that You emptied. Any place that we've tried to wrap those death death clothes back around our mind or around our bodies, we say, Jesus, we're sorry. Forgive us. We repent of partnering with a lie. And right now we receive again everything that Jesus paid for in full for us. And we say, Jesus, we ask, Holy Spirit, would You come and fill us with fresh power to walk out of that tomb and to never return. In Jesus' Name. Those of you that had your hands up, can you say with me, say, Jesus, I make a decision to walk away from the power of sin. I break agreement with the lie that says, I need to continue to partner with death. I choose to walk away and I choose to go free and stay free in the name of Jesus. Everyone who agrees with me say amen. Amen. Isn't He wonderful? Isn't Jesus just so incredible? Can we show some love and appreciation for our incredible worship team? We love you guys so much. You're amazing. Begin Begin to make your way back to your seats. Bless you guys. And let's enjoy some church news together as we find our way back to our seats. Hi, Bethel family. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. We are so excited to celebrate the power of Jesus' resurrection with you today. Here's this week's church news. Bethel Singles is a community for singles that provides organic opportunities for connection, growth, and fun. They have some incredible events planned this month, including a Kaylee, which that's not it, babe. It's a night of Scottish dancing, not Irish dancing. They're a lot of fun though. A worship night and more. Check out Bethel.com forward slash singles to learn more. If you want to expand your capacity for joy and hope, this one's for you. Join Steve and Wendy Backlund for a Bounding Hope and Joy conference on April 28th and 29th. It's going to be a time of acceleration, activation, and breakthrough as we hear from Steve and Wendy, Aaron and Connie Jones, and worship with Hannah Waters. Tickets are limited, so register now. Join Bethel Kids for an unforgettable week of fun, faith, and discovery at Bethel Kids Revival Camp. This overnight camp for third to fifth graders is a powerful time where your child can pursue the presence of God and learn to stay rooted in love and truth. At Bethel Healing School, we will explore a heavenly culture that leads us into a lifestyle of healing and miracles. I have to say, this was the first event I've ever been a part of with Bethel over 12 years ago, and it changed my life. It was the first time I ever experienced the tangible presence of God. And so I wanna encourage you to come, be inspired, activated, and launched as you gain powerful tools for ministry that Jesus modeled. Register today at Bethel.com forward slash events. That's it for this week's Church News. If you missed any of these announcements, go to Bethel.com forward slash church news to learn more. Have an amazing week. And have a great rest of your Easter day. Amazing. How many of you are so excited just to be here tonight? It's been such a celebration of what Christ did on the cross and His victory rose again. Well, I would love to just welcome our first time guests. If you are here for the first time, we would love for you just to stand and we want to just welcome you. So if you're here for the first time tonight, would you just stand? We want to honor you tonight. Can we just clap for our first time guests? Amazing. If you're watching online, why don't you, stand, why don't you continue to stand? 
So we're gonna have just a couple of moments just to do some prophetic ministry. And I wanted to tell you, this is your first time here. I remember being here about 10 years ago, right in this section, and getting my whole world. My husband and I were here, it was our 10 year wedding anniversary. We were just getting our whole world just rocked. And people gathered around us together, praying for breakthrough in a particular area. And so I just, would you, if you're near them, I would love for you just to pray for them. If there's any breakthrough in your life that you're just like, man, I'm needing breakthrough in this area, or any impossible situation that looks impossible, that God's just saying over you tonight, it's made possible through Him. It's made possible through Jesus. So if you're next to Him, just begin praying for them, And I wanna read this scripture over our visitors tonight. It's in Ephesians 4. It says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. So God, we bless our incredible visitors. I thank you, Jesus, for any situation that is impossible, any breakthrough that they're needing right now, God. We just say, would you do the the possible situation in their lives right now, tonight, God. We thank you for breakthrough. We pray for any healing in their bodies that needs to be happening tonight, God. We just declare that this is a marking night. I heard that over the Lord during worship. This is a marking night for our visitors tonight. So I thank you, Jesus. Your life will never be the same because you've encountered the love of the Father encounter breakthrough tonight. So God, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Can we just give God praise for what he's gonna do? Thank you. Thanks, God. Amazing. Well, I would love to just pray for anyone that is actually in business. You own your own business. I would love for you just to stand up. That's you, anyone that is actually in business. Amazing. Oh, there's a lot of you. Woo! Let's go. Okay, in worship, I heard miracles in the marketplace. And I felt like there were specific things with that, that I believe that God is actually, I saw you in position. He says, it's time to get in position. He's positioning you. I saw uh, the Lord calling you generals. And um, there are people and and, uh, specific people that God's put in your path that are divine, um, just divine connections and relationships where I do believe God's gonna open up opportunities for you to be able to speak in them, to them and to lead them to the Lord. I actually saw even like wrists being healed, like, like literally miracles in the marketplace happening. God is opening up the doors. He's busting open the doors in the marketplace. I also saw um, a crumpled piece of paper um, in the trash can and I heard the Lord say, it's time to get those blueprints out that you had before in the Lord's that it's time to revisit those because he's gonna, I just saw him blowing on these blueprints and he's, he's giving that strategy that you thought was trash. The Lord is saying like, no, that was not trash. It just was not for that season. It's for now. And I saw the Lord saying, he put it out on the table, blew on it. It says it's time. And so whatever that means to you, if there's specific uh, uh, words that you've gotten, specific strategy, but I believe that God is giving you fresh new sight and blueprints for this season. So God, I bless all these business owners owners. I thank you, Jesus, that they prosper. And I thank you for miracles in the marketplace, Jesus, that that people will be led to you, Jesus. I pray, Father, for even miraculous physical healing. And I thank you, Jesus, for strategies and blueprints from heaven, God, that are going to change the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Hello, Um, I'm Cassie. I'm one of our Revival Group pastors with BSSM Online. Super excited. Um, I have a word of knowledge. Um, I got the year or the number 1976 and the name Barbara. Does that, the two of those link to anyone? 1976 and Barbara? Anyone? If you will raise your hand. If not, that's okay. I'm an online pastor, so I always know that God puts people in our online church community. And uh, I'm just gonna release this word. I felt like um, God was honoring this person for their faithfulness. And I felt like God was highlighting Philippians 1, 6. And he said, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And I felt like this person, this Barbara, uh, 1976, I felt like something had fallen apart in the last season and it actually left you a bit discouraged. And I saw the Lord rebuilding things in your life and actually felt he was saying it's time to build again. And I felt like there was something linked with um, business. That's actually really interesting that Jory went after business, but I felt like for you, um, 
It felt like because business had fallen apart, you felt like, I can't do this again. It's too risky. But I feel like the Lord's saying, Barbara, it's time. Barbara, I will back you up. And I felt like the Lord was bringing a fruitful reward for you because of the faithfulness of your past season. And the Lord was gonna show up for you in this next season, allow you to step into things that you never even thought was possible. You actually, I felt like for you, um, you've been dreaming. Ooh, you've been dreaming. But because things didn't work out, you actually let those dreams die. And I feel like God was gonna resurrect your dreams and allow you to step into the fruit of this next season. So Barbara, I bless you. Um, thank you, God. And then I, I felt deep nausea. And I don't know if anyone's been like suffering from um, nausea, um, but I felt like God was gonna heal nausea. Um, but, but really the word that I had was, there's a lot of people in this room who are facing transition. And I felt some of you are facing transition to the point where you actually feel sick to your stomach. I felt like for some of you, you felt like you had to make really big decisions. And because of um, these massive decisions in your life, you've actually been feeling sick to your stomach. Is that anyone in this room? Like you've been having, okay, yeah, thank you, God. Yeah, you can stand if you wanna stand. Um, Holy Spirit, I felt, uh, I felt what I felt the Lord saying was it's gonna be easier than you think. What I felt the Lord was saying was, he said, um, <laughs> I will lead you where you're meant to go. You get to just take the step. And I felt like the Lord said, it's not up to you to open the door. It's not up to you to make everything happen. The job opportunities, whoa, where you're supposed to be. You just follow in obedience to what the Father is doing. And I felt like he said, it's easier than you think it's gonna be. And I felt like that nausea that was coming up, God was actually filling you with peace. And he was saying, no more do you get to allow this um, sick to your stomach feeling lead you. I will lead you with my peace into the place of your destiny. So if that's you, I want you to receive that word knowing that the Prince of Peace is guiding you into your promised land. And all you get to do is follow with obedience. I bless you. Wow, Jesus. Well, my name's Clint. I'm a revival group pastor in second year. Woo -hoo! Um, if you are wearing blue, why don't you stand up for me quickly? Jeans can't. I'm, I'm wearing blue, so I'm including myself in this tonight. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. <clears throat> wow. So this is, this is what I saw is um, I literally walked up here and God's like, I'm on blue tonight. I looked down, there's a blue plug and there's a blue straw. Amen. Okay. So what is the Lord saying? <laughs> is I, I felt like God wanted to, uh, one, protect some of your dream life and two, wanted to increase some of your dream life. And uh, some of you, your dream life has been stale and I saw like this water, I saw God coming like a muddy river, like a rain on your dream life. But He's actually guarding your dream life in this season. Some of you have had night terrors and from tonight you're not going to have any more night terrors. So God, right now I bless every single person, including myself with blue jeans. I bless our dream life in Jesus' name, God. I thank you for peace as we sleep. I thank you for patent ideas in the evenings. I thank you for miracle ideas in the evenings. I thank you for anointings in the evenings, God. I thank you that you would heal people as they sleep. Even tonight, people have had insomnia. I pray that tonight would be the first night that they would lie their head on their bed and would have the best sleep of their night. And everybody said, amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, it's that time tonight where we get to do offering. And uh, what an amazing day to give Jesus something, right? Wow. Today, so many years ago, everything changed for all of us in this room. And uh, I, had this, uh, I had this crazy, um, I was asking God, what do you want me to share? And when, when I first came to Bethel, before I was a student, as a visitor, um, I didn't really know much about this place. And uh, anyway, I was staying at a host. And that night, um, I had a dream, like a dream dream. So I just blessed all your dreams. And in that dream, I went into this, into this room, like this endless room. And inside this room was all the stuff. And I was walking with the Father. And I said to God, I was like, God, what, what is this room? And uh, God said to me, oh, this is one of the storehouses of heaven. And in this room, there were like patent ideas. There were yachts. There were a bunch of money. There were uh, crazy business ideas, all this stuff. And then God looked at me and he said, what do you do with a storehouse? And this is just in my dream. And I looked at the Father. I said, oh, I store things that I don't normally use. And then God looked at me and he said, for generations upon generations, people have not because they ask not. And uh, I woke up 
And I was like, okay, that's an interesting <laughs> dream. The next night, I go into another dream. And in the dream, God says to me, hey, write down three things on a list that you want from me. So one of the things I write down is a business idea. And in the dream, God gives me this business idea. Long story short, I wake up, I end up pursuing that uh, idea, which was a product. That product ended up paying for us to come here and do first and second year. And I felt like tonight, as you give your tithe and offering, as you sow seed in your dreams, I feel like God is going to open the resource rooms of heaven to some of you tonight. And we're going to read uh, offering number two, so if we can pull it up. And part of this offering says, unlock the storehouses. So as we read this in faith, that's what God's going to do. So why don't you stand with me, and we're going to read offering number two. Amen? All right. As we receive today's offering... We are believing you for heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, impartations, divine manifestations, anointings and giftings and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources, to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying the kingdom of the nation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will show faith and blessing and increase upon me. So I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we got the buckets here. We're gonna rush the buckets as the band plays, but I'm just gonna pray quickly and I'm gonna release my testimony over you. So God, I just thank you for every seed sown tonight. I release my testimony of the resource rooms of heaven would be unlocked upon every single body here tonight in Jesus' name, amen. You can come rush the buckets. The Son of Heaven rose again, oh tremble death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And on the third at break of dawn, the sun Give it up for the band, can we? Great job. I saw, you know, the drummer, what's the drummer's name? Huh, Nathan? What is it? Nathan? Nathan, yeah. That's a good name. You like that name, huh? Is that your birth name? No, that's good. Shouldn't change it. I saw when you were drumming tonight, I saw like this warring thing coming out of you. And uh, I saw like you turn into a, like a warrior drummer and I saw when you were drumming, I saw like this demonic forces fleeing. I saw like an anointing like that was on David that drove the evil spirits out of Saul. And I feel like there's some kind of deliverance anointing that's coming on you in music and that when you play the drums, it's like some kind of a warring 
thing in the heavens and that, I don't know what it's all about, but um, I just feel like the Lord's given you a deliverance ministry and a part of it's coming through your drums. So I bless what God's doing to you. In Jesus' name, that's a good word. Well, why don't you grab a hand? Some of you haven't had dates for months. <laughs> grab a hand right here. And if, you, uh, if you'd like to date the person next to you, just squeeze that hand. Be bold. Go where no man's ever gone before. And uh, if it's a yes, just squeeze back. That would be great. You can set up the date after the session tonight. Lord, we bless. We bless this Holy Spirit anointing. And they were all in one place. And uh, they, and I just like, I claim Acts 1 over you. You had one mind and one, just keep holding hands. It's the most <laughs> exciting thing that's happened to some of you in months right here. I'll pray really slow. Thank you, Lord, for all of these people. We pray for love, love, love. All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love, love. Love is all you need. Whoa, feel that? That was good. See, all the online audience, see, this is why you need to come to church. Okay, you can let go of hands right now. Lord, we pray for you. This word that you would bless this word today and let these people know I'm right. <laughs> Amen. Well, um, it's been a while since I preached on Sunday night. This is really fun tonight. And all these people having an experience in the baptismal tank. So cool. And, you know, the old man's dead and the new man's rising out of the tub. And just a great to be baptized on Easter. Something special about that. And, I don't know, being baptized anytime is pretty special, really. But um, I, I think I'll talk about um, the resurrection. <laughs> I was praying about it, and I thought, it's Easter, maybe we should talk about the resurrection. So, did Bill talk about the resurrection this morning? I, I, he did? Oh, that's good. That's good. Because on Friday night, we left Jesus in the tomb, so I was like, hoping Jesus would come out of the tomb on Sunday. It's very good. Well, I'm sure to John 20 and... I have all these things to do tonight I think are going to be fun. We'll see. Maybe not, but I think they will be. Um, let's, uh, I, this is probably the most read story on Easter, but I feel to just uh, read, read it again. John 20, verse 1, obviously speaking of the resurrection. <clears throat> now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they had laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran faster than Peter and got to the tomb first. That's the only place in the entire Bible that tells you that John beat Peter to the tomb. And John wrote it. I just think it's so funny to me. In my, in, my, in my paper Bible, I have, and who really cares? <laughs> I guess John does, though. So Peter and John ran to the tomb. John got there first, and stooping, um, I'm sorry, da -da 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 -da. okay, and stoop, snoop, stooping, it's not snooping, snooping in, stooping in, he saw, <laughs> stooping in, <He's laughs> very old translation, he saw the linen wrapping lying there, but he did not go in. And so Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb and saw the linen wrapping lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrapping, but rolled by itself in another place. And the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. For they, as yet, they did not understand the scripture that, they must, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. So she wept and stood. She stooped and looked in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? 
And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said, in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to your brethren and say to them, I ascended to my father and your father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene announcing to the disciples, Mary Magdalene announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then he said these things to her. When it was evening and the day, when it was evening, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them both his hands inside. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. What a powerful portion of scripture. And um, I, I, I wanna, I wanna point out a few things out of the scripture. Um, it's interesting to me that when Jesus rose from the dead, it says that there was two linen wrappings, one that covered his face and one that covered the body. And the one that covered the body was still in place where the body once laid, did you notice that? But the one that covered the face was folded up and put in another place. And I, did you notice that Jesus was crucified at a place called Golgotha, which means the skull? Why was Jesus crucified at a place called the skull? Because how many know he's the head of the church? He's the head of the church. And Jesus was crucified with a crown of thorns. Why a crown of thorns? Remember what the curse over Adam was? The curse over the serpent was you'll crawl on your belly and you'll eat dirt and I'll put enmity or hostility between you and the woman. The curse over the woman is that God will increase your pain in childbirth but your, but your desire will still be for your husband but he'll rule over you. By the way, it was a curse that your husband will rule over you and it wasn't that all men would rule all women. It's that you when, you, when you marry, your husband will be your ruler. How many know that was the curse? A good point. Thank you, Chris, for that. Good point. Ladies, you should have been like shouting. I felt like you're like something. There's a bondage we need to break here. But the curse over Adam is that you're going to till the ground, but it's going to yield thorns and thistles. In other words, you're going to do the right thing, but the wrong thing's going to happen. How many know the, the, a curse means you do the right thing and the wrong thing happens? How many know there's three levels of life? There's curses, what I just explained to you. You can do the right thing, you're going to till the ground, but it's going to yield thorns and thistles. And then there's sowing and reaping. That means you get what you deserve. But how many know the highest level of life is inheritance? That means you get what someone else worked for. When Jesus died on the cross, he had a crown of thorns on his head. Why? Because he was breaking the curse off the earth. And how many know the curse wasn't just on humans, it was also on creation. How many know that Jesus didn't just die for humans, he died for all creation. That's why Jesus said, preach this gospel to all creation. And that's why creation itself is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. So when Jesus rose from the dead, the, the, the head was revealed. Remember he took the cloth and he, and he set it another side, but the place where the body once was, the cloth was still in place. Why? Because when Jesus rose from the dead, the head was revealed, but the body had yet to be revealed. In Romans 8, 28, in fact, let me just read this to you. In Romans 8, 28, you've probably read this many times before as I have, but it says this, for all being, who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For he, we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children... If we are children, then we are heirs also, 
heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ Jesus. Indeed, if we've suffered with him, so we also may be glorified with him. For I am considered that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's about to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For all creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself would also be set free from slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that all creation is groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And I just want to point out that when Jesus died on the cross, the head was revealed. But how many know that creation's been waiting for the body to be revealed? And um, all of creation is waiting for the body to be revealed. And I want to point out that when Jesus rose from the dead, the curse over creation was to be broken. The curse over creation. Why did Jesus wear a crown of thorns? Because remember, again, Adam, you're going to till the ground, but it's going to yield thorns and thistles. How many know Jesus is destroying that way of thinking? I'm going to do the right thing, but the wrong thing's going to happen. How many understand that now the lowest level of life is not curses, it's reap, sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows, so shall he reap. How many know that sowing and reaping is a blessing? Because before Jesus died on the cross, you could do the right thing, but the wrong thing still happened because we were under a curse. But that curse was broken when Jesus rose from the dead. He broke the curse so that you can actually get what you receive. As a matter of fact, you can get what others, re- <laughs> what others work for. You can actually work for, you can actually expect a legacy in your life. And so, and then um, I love this part too, that Jesus, Jesus tells Mary, Magdalene, go tell my disciples that I'm alive. I I don't know why people don't think women should be in the ministry. (laughs) I know this is, this is getting to be a sermon, right? A subject, a sermon, but I I just, I feel to say that Jesus came to set the oppressed free in the first century. The most oppressed people group were not black people, weren't Asian people, weren't, you can name your favorite ethnic group. It was actually women. Women were the the most oppressed people group in the day of Christ. And it's interesting that Jesus tells 12 disciples, on the third day, I'm gonna rise. Okay, guys, listen, I'm gonna die, but on the third day, I'm gonna rise. He tells them that for three years to the place where Peter goes, never shall you die. And Jesus said, Jesus had just told him a few minutes before, like flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you when he said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And five minutes later, Peter's like, never shall you die. And he goes, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) He had a bipolar kind of relationship. But for three years, Jesus tells disciples, listen guys, here it is. I'm gonna die and then on the third day, I'm gonna rise. Okay, guys, follow me. Okay, get this. You know when you take a seed, you put it in the ground and it dies, and then it comes to life? Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm a seed, I'm gonna put it in the ground, and then on the third day, I'm gonna rise. Okay, you guys got that? Okay, on the third day, I'm gonna rise. See, all of creation, how many know, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen in what God made. So that unbelievers are actually without excuse. That's Romans 1. God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen, clearly seen in what God made. So that unbelievers are without excuse. In other words, you don't have to know the Bible. You can look at creation and know there's a God. And also you can know a lot about God. How does every time you plant a dead seed and it grows a live tree, God goes, resurrection. Every time you... You know, they took seeds that were in King Tut's tomb. Do you remember this? This is like 30 years ago. And they were in that tomb for, I don't know, some historian would know, but like hundreds of years, thousands of years. And they took those seeds after they'd been in King Tut's tomb, dead, right? Dead, 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 (laughs) dead. And they planted them and those seeds grew. Are you with me? And every time you take a dead seed that you can't find any life in and you put it in the ground and it grows anything, God goes, resurrection. God goes, I I am telling the resurrection story. I put it right in creation. 
Take a dead seed, put it in the ground, and it speaks of, I was dead and now I'm alive. Like actually creation is telling the story of resurrection. God said, make it as dead as you can, carry it around for a thousand years, put it in the ground, it will grow. You know why? Because of resurrection power. <laughs> You're getting, uh, getting this. And Jesus told the disciples, okay, uh, no, see, the, see, they put it in the ground, it died, come to life. Yeah, okay, now that's what I'm gonna do. And you know, and when they finally got up, Peter's like, never gonna die. And Jesus like, you missed the point of the message, Pete. <laughs> like you have your sights set on man and not on God. So three and a half years, Jesus says, now remember, dead on the first day, one, a two, a three. On the third day, I'm going to rise. How many disciples were waiting for Jesus on the third day? Uh, zero. <laughs> zero. Not one disciple was waiting for Jesus on resurrection day, except for Mary. Well, those women, they're just not spiritual. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to put a plug in there. The story's just too good to not do that. Well, women shouldn't teach the Bible. If it wasn't for women, Peter would still be waiting for Jesus to rise. Now, Mary goes and tells 11 disciples, Judas by now has hung himself. How many disciples even go to check it out? Two. <laughs> 11 disciples, on the third day, I'm gonna rise. You get it? One, a, a two, a three. <laughs> Mary comes, Jesus is alive, it's the third day. <laughs> nah. I mean, these are the guys who started the early church. So listen, you think you've had a bad day? <laughs> you think you got a bad start? Like you think, well, you know, I don't know how spiritual I am. 11 guys with Jesus. Nine of them said, nah. <laughs> Mary comes back, she's like, I've seen the Lord. Peter and John go, they're like, I, we've went to the tomb. His body's gone. Thomas like, I doubt it. <laughs> like this, these are the world changers. These are God's history makers, his world changers. Like, what's your excuse? I don't know if I believe, they didn't either. <laughs> and then Jesus walks through the wall <laughs> and says, uh, peace be with you. <laughs> How many know after Jesus rose from the dead, he never used a door because he is the door. You don't know how you're gonna get out of this situation. It looks like there's no door. Peace be with you. You're in a situation where you feel trapped. Jesus shows up, he's a door. There's no way out, I'm a door. I'm in a prison, I'm a door. I'm in a situation that has no answer, I'm a door. You might feel like you're in prison, but when you invite Jesus, there's a new door. Did we get a permit for that? Did we get a building permit for that? There's a new door. Are you with me? And Jesus shows up, he's the door. So Thomas is like, I won't believe it unless I see, unless I put my hand in his scars, unless I put my hand in his side, and Jesus saw, hey, Tom. <laughs> he touched me. <laughs> Some of you have scars. Isn't it interesting that Jesus for eternity has scars? Some of you think your scars reveal your past, but I propose that your scars are a testimony of his healing in your life. I'll feel scarred, you will be for eternity. That's God's testimony in your life. Jesus carried him into, all the way into heaven. Now, he will have those scars forever. Those scars are not PTSD. Those scars are 
I destroyed the works of the devil. They had me dead and now I'm alive. That's a really good word actually. So I'll fill the back up and just say, there's a lot of us that get disappointed in ourselves. We're like, you know, I just went through a whole season. I don't know. I'm just like, I'm like doubting Thomas. And you just feel like you're disqualified because you're just like, deal with doubt. You're in a situation, you're like, I don't know, if I had the faith of Bill Johnson, I probably wouldn't have a problem. And you know, gosh, if I had the faith of the disciples, if you had the faith of the disciples, you probably wouldn't even show up at the tomb. <laughs> and Jesus said this, blessed are those, Thomas, who don't see yet believe. That would be everybody in this room. That would be everybody watching on our campus online, on our online campus. I just wanna say, get over yourself. Stop being so hard on yourself. Jesus discipled personally 11 guys and his main message is, on the third day, I'm gonna rise. Now, Matthew, you, you know, you're a tax collector. You can do the math, right? On the third day, I'm gonna rise. And nobody showed up. Not a single man showed up. Only a disqualified woman who shouldn't be preaching the gospel. According to John MacArthur. I don't know. He said that publicly, so I thought I'd say that publicly, you know. Thank God for John. He's an awesome man. Just disempowered half the army of God. I have no war with him. I, I, I love him dearly. I'm just making a statement. When Jesus rose from the dead, he eternally disarmed the destructive weapons of sin, and death, hell, and the grave. For sin could not tempt him, death could not defeat him, hell could not keep him, and the grave could not hold him. Turn to Colossians chapter one, verse 15. You guys okay? I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that about John. I really do think he's an amazing man of God. Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn, from the dead. Everybody say the firstborn from the dead. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. I love this. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't the first one to ever be resurrected. You remember that there was Lazarus, for example. There were five people, I think five people in the Old Testament that rose from the dead. Jesus wasn't the first people, person to rise from the dead, but he was the first born from the dead. He was the first person ever born from the dead. How many of you know, when you received Jesus Christ, you became born again? But the firstborn was Jesus. He remains not just your Lord, but your elder brother. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was the firstborn. He became the seed. Are you with me? He became the seed. See, Lazarus rose from the dead, but he wasn't reborn. He wasn't the firstborn. How many know the firstborn has preeminence over the family? The firstborn carries the inheritance for the family. Jesus was the first one to rise from the dead. Jesus was the firstborn. 
Someone said, is Jesus, was Jesus born again? I don't know, let's not go that far, but let's just say what the scripture says. The scripture says he was the firstborn of all creation. That's really powerful. Colossians 2, 15 says this, when he had disarmed the rulers, speaking the resurrection, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. How many of you know that when Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated sin, death, hell, and the devil? He defeated him. Like, do you know that most, many people in this room and many people on our online campus are running from a disarmed and defeated devil? The devil's after me. You have power over him. <laughs> he has no power over you. He's been disarmed and defeated. He got no arms and no feet. I mean, just picture that for a minute. You got a devil with no arm and no feet. He's chasing me. He can't even chase you. He might be a rolling stone, but he can't run very fast. <laughs> just think about that for a minute. I'm just pointing out that he has no authority. You, Jesus, in Matthew 28, when he rose from the dead, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, because I have all authority, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all I taught you. For lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth, into the world. He, you, you're running from a defeated and disarmed devil. And I'm telling you that in your life, the only way he gets authority is if you deputize him. Let me say that again. The only way he gets authority in your life is if you deputize him. Because he has no authority. But our fear is faith in the wrong kingdom. You know, people say this all the time. You see it in the store. I do it to each other. We do it to each other. We say, bless you, man. Bless you, bro. Hey, man, see you in the store. Hey, God bless you. And we're like, yeah, God bless you too. And it's kind of like a greeting that's like, hi. Like, I think we mean like, hi. <laughs> hi. But we say, bless you. Can you imagine if a witch or a warlock came in here and said, I curse you? There would be 10 times more anxiety over someone who was, who was demonic saying, I curse you, than a brother who says, I bless you. And yet there's a thousand times more power in his blessing than in their curse. I remember, and this has been many years ago, we used to have a lot of demonic activity in our services. Yeah, staff. <laughs> this is kind of an old, uh, this is a funny story. Like 10 years ago, one of, one of our team, uh, one of our leaders was said to, uh, in a team meeting, you know, I don't know if, why we need sozo ministry anymore. Like we don't have any demonic manifestations anymore. It's kind of a waste of money. I'm like, we don't have any demonic manifestations because we have sozo. Yeah. Do you know our Sozo teams average 970 appointments a month? You wanna know why people aren't flopping and dropping in here? Because they're flopping and dropping over there. It's a sign that things get healthy because they over there are casting out demons so you can pay attention to anointed speaker. Don't tear down the fence till you know why they put it up, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's okay, here we go. This sounds like a political statement. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, let's just offend everyone tonight. Maybe we should call out some politicians tonight. Just go ahead and lose my job. Lose my anointing, at least. I can't remember what I was talking about now. Oh, I remember. We, were, we, were, we, we, we often have people on lines. In fact, we, we'll, we do that here still. You know, we put, after the you know, ministry time, we 
just have people lined up on lines and we just have ministry teams that go out and minister to them. And we should do that. Like Bill used to say, look at that, there's a feather. (laughs) That doesn't happen. That's not really there. (laughs) Why do you guys talk about feathers? I don't know. I fly around me when I'm talking. Very distracting. Anyway, (laughs) Bill used to always say, the real anointing comes after midnight. (laughs) Oh, great. I'll go home. I'll come back at midnight. (laughs) And I remember we had people lined up and we, man, we have so many stories of crazy stuff that used to happen. But, uh, (laughs) but I remember this, uh, this guy was standing right there. It's, it's not significant that you're standing there. (laughs) I'm just being funny. It's not, it's just happened. And, uh, Somebody was trying to minister to him, and he said, Satan is stronger than God. So um, she's the minister that one of the, the older gals who was praying for him came over and said, hey, I think there's a problem. I'm like, what's the problem? She's like, that man said that Satan's stronger than God. I said, well, he isn't. She's like, well, Pastor Chris, come and pray for him. I'm like, nah, you, you take care of it. She's like, no, I think you should come and take care of it. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. So we went over there, and he's like seething. He's on the line. He's seething. And I said, uh, I heard you got a problem. He goes, I got no problems. Satan's stronger than God. I said, nah. Now, I know right now that if I get afraid, I just gave him my authority. So I started laughing. I noticed, like, get nervous, laugh. The joy of the Lord is really my strength right now. So I started to pray for them, and he got really mad, and he decided to hit me. And he's like, he goes, and this thing was talking out of his stomach, which was kind of interesting too. And all of that is a show to make you afraid. It's all to make you afraid. Like, why is all that happening? Why are all those manifestations happening? Not because they're demonized, but because the demon in him is trying to scare you. And I, and I, and I, and I just start laughing at him. And so he swung at me and he, with his right hand, and I just stood there like this. And inside, I'm like, please don't let him hit me. (laughs) But I'm just laughing at him. And he goes, oh, and I could feel the wind from his fist. And he got like a quarter inch from my face. And he hit something, but it wasn't my face. And then he goes, (laughs) And then he swung again with his left hand, and he hit something else. And it was really fun then. And so I said, well, now it's my turn. And I put my hand on his head, and I said, let the fire of God fall on this guy. And he starts, (laughs) and he starts jackhammering. (laughs) And he starts screaming, Satan, help me. (laughs) Oh, I forgot this part. When I first put my hand on his head, I said, in the name of Jesus, the fire of God come on this guy. And he goes, we've been here for generations. (laughs) I said, I've been here for generations too. It feels like... I feel like I've been here forever. <laughs> then he started screaming, Satan, help me. He, goes, he can't help you. Fire of God. Down he goes on the floor. Yes. That was fun. <laughs> I love that story because it demonstrates the power of peace. Like peace is a weapon. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. How many know peace is a weapon? When you determine that you are not going to be afraid of your enemy, like Psalms 2, that the nations plot against the Lord, but he laughs, he thinks it's funny. The Lord is like, hey, Peter, look at this. Unbelievable. But they think they, (laughs) There's humor in heaven. But God's sense of humor is a little different than ours. He really thinks it's funny when 
finite men think that they can beat God. Do you know that? Then what are you worried about? Well, I don't see any way out. He's a door. He's a resurrection and life. That's a good word. Okay, look at Romans chapter 6. Are you guys bored? No. Okay. One of my core values for preaching is thou shall not bore. <laughs> my other core value is try to be accurate. <laughs> I mean, I am trying to be. Romans uh, 6 1. <laughs> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so grace may increase? Um, the end of chapter 5 said this, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So Paul teaches for five chapters. He's teaching that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. And then he goes on to say that no matter how deep you fall, his point for five chapters is, listen, don't matter how deep you fall, grace can rescue you. No matter how bad of life you've had, grace can deliver you. No matter... How evil you've been, the Lord can change your heart. No matter how much you've been abused, God can heal your heart. No, no matter how sick your body is, God can restore your body. And, and he goes on in, in Romans to say that grace is not like the law because the law had no power to change you. The law told you all the things you did wrong, but it had no power to change you. But then grace came. And so the, the climax of Paul's five-chapter argument is, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It's like a motto statement of five chapters. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Oh, God can never save whatever, whatever you, you think the worst city is. San Francisco is so big. Hey, you know what? If where sin abounds, if grace abounds all the more, you're more likely to have a revival in a place where sin abounds because God goes, that's where grace abounds all the more. Just tell God you can't do it. God just like, God, I just don't think you can do it. Like, just use reverse psychology on him. I bet you can't heal me. <laughs> I'm just joking, that was really, that was inaccurate. I, just, I know that. <laughs> my point is, my point is that when God, you, you are competitive because God's competitive. It's part of the nature of God. You know, remember God said to David, David, they said I can, I can beat him in the valley, but I can't beat him in the mountains. The next time we, we fight him, we're gonna fight him in the mountains. God's like, don't tell me I can't do it. Don't tell me I can't do it. I can do anything. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So Paul, remember there were no chapter numbers or verse numbers. This was all one letter to the Romans. And by the time he gets to chapter five, he says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It, he, he realizes that he's just made a case that maybe you should sin so you can get more grace. Because how many of you know grace isn't just undeserved favor? Grace is the operational power of God. Grace gives you the ability to do what you couldn't do one second before you heard. Are you with me? What I'm saying is, when we say we got saved by grace, it's not just undeserved favor. How I many know oh, mercy means you didn't get what you deserve? Like if you were going 50 miles over the speed limit and an officer pulled you over and did not give you a ticket, how I many know oh, that's mercy? You, you didn't get what you deserve. And by the way, in order for you to get mercy, you have to actually admit that you had a transgression. <laughs> if you make your identity, if your, if your transgression becomes your identity, so you no longer say, that's not what I do, it's who I am. How many know you can't receive mercy because you don't admit you're wrong? Are you with me? Just think through that for a minute. You can think that through by yourself, right? But grace, if a police officer pulls you over going 50 miles over the speed limit, and he, instead of giving you a ticket, he gives you $1,000 for speeding, that's grace. Grace means you got what you didn't deserve. Mercy, said, mercy means you didn't get what you deserve. But grace, when, it, when the Bible says you were saved by grace and not by works, 
Grace gives you the ability to do what you couldn't do one second before you received grace. So how many understand that when God saved us, he didn't just go, okay, you did a bunch of bad stuff, I forgive you. How many know that just left you, it, it erased the board, but it did not give you any power to not do it again. But how many know Jesus didn't do that? When he didn't just erase your sins, he actually gave you power to not sin. How many know Jesus saved you from sin so that you don't have to sin because you have power over sin now? Sin used to have power over you. Listen, if someone had a prophetic word for you, and it really was a prophetic word, and they said, I see you as a nurse, and you, were, you weren't a nurse, and you go, what? I'm not a nurse. How I many you know a word of knowledge is information that's currently true? So if I called you out and said, I see you as a nurse and you're a nurse, how I many you know that's a good word, but it's not a prophecy? Because prophecy is always about the future. Follow me for a minute. When somebody calls you out and says, I see you as a nurse, and if it is the word of the Lord, not a mistake, how I many you know they just gave you a they just gave you the ability to be what you weren't? That's called grace. If someone calls you out and says, I see you as a teacher, and you're like, teacher, I'm dyslexic, I'm afraid of people, I don't understand whatever the Bible, but when you received the word, if you receive a prophet, name the prophet, you see the prophet's word. What is the prophet's word? The ability to do what you couldn't do one second before you heard it. What I'm getting at is that when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't just forgive you. He gave you power to change. Are you with me? So when Paul realizes where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, and it sounds like he just made a case for, you should sin so you can get more power. He realizes that he has to fix that before he goes on. So he makes this statement. Shall we, what shall we say? Shall we continue to sin so grace may increase? How many know he just made a theological problem for himself? And then he says this, may it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was, past tense, crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with so that we are no longer slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Greatest lie in Christendom. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Not true. Not true. You were a sinner. I was a sinner. When I received Jesus Christ, I became a saint. People are like, that's semantics. No, it's not. I am no longer a sinner because sin is not my identity. I am not an alcoholic because an alcoholic is an identity. I don't care how much you drink, you are not an alcoholic. You cannot identify as a sinner because you, if you receive Jesus Christ, you're, <laughs> the power of grace freed you from the power of sin. Because how many know you died? <laughs> Here we go. I'd like to point out that Jesus didn't just die for you. He died as you. Okay, first he died for me. What's that mean? It means that when he died on the cross, he paid for my sin. Are you with me? Okay, think about it like this. In the Old Testament, there was no, there was no, there was no, there was no uh, payment for sin. Are you with me? So think about, uh, I, I, let's, say, let's say that Tom's the judge. He's the judge. And let's say that Ben killed my brother. And we go before the judge, and the judge says, uh, and I say to the judge, Your Honor, Bill killed my Ben killed my brother. Bill, Bill kills somebody. We'll get to Bill later. <laughs> We're not letting Bill off tonight. He ain't here. 
Ben killed my brother. And Tom turns to Ben and goes, oh, your father and I used to play golf together. Go free. How many of that's mercy? How many know that's mercy? But it's not justice. How many know that God is a righteous ju judge? He sits on the mercy seat, but the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. How many know that God, can I say, has a problem? Because God wants to release mercy, but he has to create justice. Are you with me? So Ben's mother steps up and said, your honor, I will die for my son. And the judge looks through the journals of fugitives and he says, you can't die for Ben because you owe for your own sin. How many know the soul that sins shall die? You can't die for him because you owe for your own. All of a sudden, the son of the judge enters the courtroom and he says, your honor, I will die for Ben. The judge looks into the journals of fugitives and says, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, wait a second, you don't owe, you never sin. So the, the judge says, you can die for him because you don't owe for your own. So how many you know when Jesus dies for Ben, he creates justice. So now God can release mercy without being crooked. What's the difference between the new and old covenant? Jesus died on the cross, he created justice. So God can release mercy. See, mercy costs God, his son. Because God is a righteous God. And he said, I must have justice. I mean, you know, we see it all, all the time on Fox News and different news where this person molests a kid, rapes a woman, does some hideous crime, and the judge gives him mercy and says, oh, you don't have to do any time. And we're all like, whoa, 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 wait a second. This guy is a serial rapist and you let him go. And we all go, that's not just, that's wrong. That's a crooked judge. Because there's something in us that's like God. We know that sin requires judgment to create justice. So when we see somebody who did a hideous crime go free, we go, that's a crooked judge. And God goes, I'm not a crooked judge. God goes, I must have justice so that I can release mercy. And Jesus goes, I'll create that for Tom. I'll create that for Ben. I'll create that, I'll create that for Leslie. I'll create that. God, I owe nothing for myself, so I will give it for them. And God goes, great, now I have justice. Now I can release mercy. How many know mercy costs God a lot? So first of all, Jesus died for you. But Romans 6 says that Jesus didn't just die for me, that he died as me. Why does that matter? The Bible says, Romans, we just read it. Romans says that when Jesus was on the cross, that I was in Christ being crucified with him. Why is that important? Because when Jesus rose from the dead, I rose with him. So Jesus didn't just die for me, he died as me. So that his resurrection is my resurrection. You're like, someday when I, when I die, I'm gonna to go to heaven. Yes, but you're already seated in heavenly places because he already went to heaven and you were in Christ. You, he was a Trojan horse that you were in. And when he, when he died on the cross and rose again and then sat at the right hand of the Father, Ephesians chapter one says that you rose with him because he didn't just die for you, he died as you. Do you believe in a rapture? You've already had one. The question is, do you believe in it? Do you believe in your own rapture? You didn't get what I just said. I'm pointing out that you're already seated in heavenly places with Christ because when Jesus died on the cross, you died with him and when he rose, you rose with him. This baptismal tank we saw tonight, this is not a ritual. We don't do this to remember what Jesus did. See, we take communion in remembrance of what Christ did for us. Why do we take communion? To remember what side of the cross we live on. 
I take communion to remember all the benefits of this side of the cross, because I don't live on that side of the cross anymore. I'm sick, I shouldn't be. The benefits of the resurrection is that he died to set me free from my afflictions. Isaiah 53, right? Are you with me? So I'm saying, I take communion, do this, Jesus said, in remembrance of me. Every time I take the bread and the blood, I remember that I am living the power of the resurrected life. Because I live not on this side of the cross, I live on this side of the cross. For thousands of years, they lived on that side of the cross, but I live on the side of the cross where he said, your honor, I'll take their punishment. And God said, great, I'll release mercy then. And then I'll give them grace to live in a life they don't deserve. Are you with me? But baptism is not a symbolic act. Baptism is a prophetic act. What's the difference? Do you remember when Naaman the leper went to Elijah's house? Because the slave girl said, there is a prophet in Israel and he can make you well from leprosy. So the enemy commander comes to Elisha's house. This is a big risk for him. Elisha doesn't come out. He sends Gehazi. And he said, Gehazi, just go tell him to dunk seven times in the Jordan River and he'll be clean. Do you remember this story? And the commander gets so angry. He rides off because he's used to everyone honoring him. And Elisha's just, he's just another man. Tell him to go dunk seven times in the Jordan River. And he rides off and he goes, we have better water in our country than the Jordan. But his number two man, how many know the number two man? Always smarter than the number one man. <laughs> I don't know if I have a job. <laughs> At least I'll go out in flames. <laughs> the number two guy goes, why don't you just dip? I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You get wet. He literally talks his boss into going and dipping seven times. Goes down, he dips seven times, and you know what happens. The seventh time, he comes out of the water, and he is clean. Physical obedience brings spiritual release. There are two parts to the baptismal prophetic act. The first one is, we put you under the water. That's not the most powerful part. That's not even the part that we should emphasize. Because when we put you under the water, it means that you died, not, not you symbolized you died, you died with Christ. We put you under the water. And your old man dies in the tank. But the most powerful part is the second part of the prophetic act, and that's when we lift you out of the water. Because the second part of it is what happens after you died. When the sea goes to the ground, it dies. But what happens to it after it's dead? It comes out alive. And when we lift you out of the water, it's not a symbol. It's a prophetic act. And prophetic acts release grace into your life so that you have what you didn't have before you went in the tank. So you enter the tank with the cross. If anyone wants to follow Jesus, must take up his cross and follow him. But how many know Jesus was going somewhere? And Romans 6 says that he died once and for all. He didn't die 50 times. He's not being re-crucified. Well, I need Jesus to be re-crucified. No, he died once and for all. When you, get, you come into the baptismal tank with a cross, but how many know you leave with a crown? Because as he is, 1 John 4, as he is, not as he was, as he is, so are we in this world. How many know Jesus went into the tank, metaphorically a lamb, but he left a lion? I'm pointing out that he is king of kings. You're like, I'm nobody. No, you're the king, he's king over. <laughs> you're not the king, you're just a king. Well, how many kings can be in this kingdom? You're an heir. Jesus is not president of presidents, he's king of kings. If he's president of presidents, you'd have to be voted in to be an heir. But because he's king of kings, you're in his royal blood lineage. That's why you take the blood in communion, because you are part of a 
heritage and a lineage because you have received the crown through birth. Romans 8, we read it. You are joint heirs. Heir, H-E-I-R. You are an heir of Christ. Why? Because your daddy is king. You're part of a royal lineage. Well, I, don't think too, I don't want to think too highly of myself. No, but you ought to think to have sound judgment. I love it. I just watched Braveheart again. I watched Braveheart last week. I watched Gladiator the week before that. I'm like, I'm going back to warfare. I'm going to go back to find courageous people and watch it. It's Hollywooded up, but I like it because the real story is better than that in Jesus. And William Wallace is talking to Robert the Bruce, who's the king. And Robert the Bruce says to him, you need the nobles. And William Wallace says to him, why do we need the nobles? What does it mean to be noble? That's my Scottish accent, the best I can do. My favorite line in the whole movie. Why do we need the nobles? What does it mean to be noble? Men don't follow titles. They follow courage. It's pretty close, right? That's pretty close. <laughs> let, me, let me just tell you, I went to Scotland. This is a few years ago. I went to Scotland and taught. Well, first of all, I got there and uh, it, was, it was pouring rain. I'd never been there before. And they said, oh, you missed summer by one hour. <laughs> and they gave me these rubber boots. I don't know what they're called, wallies? Well, yeah, something. Yeah, I won't say, because if you say it wrong, it's the kind of dirty word in their, their language. So anyway, I preached there. It was all great. We preached in a tent. It was rain the whole time. But then we had Q&A. We had a Q&A with the, with the Scottish leaders. And after two people asked questions, I finally like, hey, I need a translator. <laughs> what language do these people speak? Thank God we won the war. Think about how the English and the Scottish have destroyed the English language. <laughs> I'll drink some tea to that. Oh boy, I don't think I'm gonna be preaching Sunday night very often. I feel totally unleashed. But here's my point. What does it mean to be noble? What does it mean? What does it mean to be noble? No, I mean sincerely. What does it mean to be noble? Because if every temptation, if you identify your temptations as your identity, then what does it mean to be noble? If my sexual attraction is not a temptation, but my identity, like I can't help it because this is the way I was born, then where does it mean to be noble? At what point do I resist anything? Because everything I'm attracted to, according to that philosophy and religion, I'm actually made for. Then the question is, what does it mean to be noble? And I'm pointing out that when you rose with Jesus, you became a part of a noble family. And it means that sin, let me tell you what it means, is no longer your master. It's not your master. Well, I feel, I feel addicted to porn. Now, I, I know what it's like to have an addiction. I get it. I get it. But let me tell you what isn't true. That thing does not have power over you. Now, let me say this. I don't say that with no compassion because I said I know what it feels like to be addicted. But the truth is what sets you free. It's not making you feel good that sets you free. It's telling you the truth that sets you free. 
I'm addicted to porn. I know that feels true. And as a boy, I was addicted to porn. So I understand what that means to be addicted. I have complete compassion for anybody who has any addiction to anything. But listen, I'm not going to get free by believing that I have no power over it. Because Jesus gave me power over sin, any sin. And it doesn't It isn't going to make it go away if I say it isn't sin. Well, it's not sin. I don't believe it's sin. I believe this is the way I was born. It's still killing you. Because you don't break the law. It only breaks you. Well, I don't believe that in gravity. Okay. Okay. But when God says no, it's not to stop you. He's the one that gave you sex drive. He's the one that created orgasms. He's the one that said taste and see. He's the one that gave you taste buds. He's the one that made you, he's the one that created you for pleasure. So when God goes, hey, I created you for pleasure, but don't have it that way. How many know God knows what he's doing? He's the one who designed you for it. Okay, here we go. Good point, Chris. I want to finish, just read this. I want to read this to you. I wrote this um, in the Supernatural Ways of Royalty book. It was the introduction. The tale of a king. Pauperhood is relegated to the children of a lesser God. It's a condition of slaves who who have yet to discover their freedom on the other side of the river of baptism and yet find themselves captured by the dark prince of torture and torment. He is the one who assigns them to a life of poverty, pain, and depression through the diabolical play of illusion, hoping to conceal their identity forever. This evil prince feeds his captors the rations of religion to fill those souls who hunger for righteousness. These slaves, blindfolded by their sin, think that they are laboring for their own freedom and work to pave their way out of prison with the bricks built from the miry clay of self-righteousness. Yet unknowingly, brick by brick, they are erecting their own chamber of death. Worse yet, they give birth to this offspring of the same darkness, ultimately creating legacies of bondage with mindsets of hopelessness. But on a hill far away, a lamb-turned lion descended into the death camp through the porthole of Golgotha. Crashing through the gates of hell, he met the dark prince and the mother of all battles. With three spikes and a thorny crown, the captain of the host conquered the devil, eternally disarming his destructive weapons of sin, death, hell, and the grave. For sin could not keep him, I'm sorry, for sin could not tempt him, death could not defeat him, hell could not keep him, and the grave could not hold him. With watching witnesses and waiting warriors, he ascended through the earth's surface. The planet quaked to release its captives while heaven thundered to receive its treasure. This wasn't just rescued souls being redeemed, but the crowning of sons who were to be revealed. For the Holy One of Radiance bought rotten, ragged sinners and recreated them into righteous, reigning saints. We are not just soldiers of the cross, we are heirs to the throne. His divine nature permeates our souls, transforms our minds, and transplants our hearts, and transfigures our spirits. We were made to be vessels of glory and vehicles of light. Others say the story is better reflected in the beautiful daughter who was ascended to the throne through marriage, for she's betrothed to the Prince of Peace. The bridal chamber is being assembled, the feast is being prepared, and the bride is making herself ready. Whether we are called the children of God, the engaged bride, a royal priesthood, the apple of his eye, or a new creation, one thing's for certain. We have captured, we have captivated the heart of our lover, who is leading a majestic entourage, for he has mounted his white horse and is making his way to the planet. Meanwhile, back on earth, God's people are rising in this present darkness and beginning to shine. His royal army is spreading the king's glory all over the earth as we take dominion of this planet back from the defeated one. Equipped with the lie of the father, his sons are finding buried treasure in the hearts of men that were once covered by rocks of offense and thorns of treachery and relics of religion. Armed with the power of the Holy Spirit and commissioned to represent the king's son, we are healing the sick, raising the dead, and displacing devils. This is resulting in paupers becoming princes and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God. I love, I was listening to T.D. Jakes last week, and he made this statement. He said, Goliath wasn't sent to kill David. He was sent to reveal him. 
So David wasn't sent to kill, Goliath wasn't sent to kill David. He was sent to reveal him. With no Goliath, there likely would have been no King David. Your problems aren't sent to destroy you. They're sent to reveal that you are an heir of God. That's such a good word. I have a few words of knowledge. Um, is there somebody in here, or maybe you're on our online campus, named May? May? Is there somebody named May? She did? Oh, is she here? Somewhere? She drowned in the baptismal tank. <laughs> somebody go raise her from the dead. I have a word for her. Um, is she in the room? Do you have someone? Oh, Okay. I'm going to give her this word anyway. I saw the Lord like healing her neck, but God says, I'm strengthening the core of your identity. And I felt the Lord was like reforming her. Uh, he was reforming her. And uh, is someone recording this? I felt that the Lord was reforming her. And the, uh, the healing of the neck, I don't know if it's a physical healing of the neck, although I saw it like a vertebrae but I feel like it's a healing of the backbone. Like God's giving May a backbone. He's giving her a backbone. He's saying, listen, May, you are strong. You are not weak. Let the weak say, I'm a mighty woman. I'm a mighty man. And I believe that the Lord is strengthening your core. He's filling you with identity and he's gonna use you as a reformer, a revivalist and a, a preacher of righteousness. And I see uh, like an evangelistic mantle coming on you in Jesus name. Thank you. Uh, for that. Okay, and um, the uh, next one is, I ha uh, someone had a dream, I think it was last night, but that you were in a den of snakes. Would you stand up if you've had a dream, especially if it was last night or this week, that you were, that you were a, in a den of snakes? Now, there probably is somebody online if it's not here in our online campus, but if that's you, would you stand up? I have a word for you. Wow, what are you waiting for? Okay, that's good. Two snakes, okay. Yes. Was this this week? Was that this week? Last night, yeah. How about you? What'd she say? In the dream? Oh, that's good. <laughs> and I think there's at least one person online too but um, I, I, f I felt like the Lord said that he has put the snakes around you so that you would learn how to do deliverance I felt there's a deliverance mantle on you and I felt that this actually this is going to sound weird you should check to see if this is theologically accurate maybe I'll stand but I felt the Lord attracting the snakes to you like he attracted Satan to Jesus in the wilderness, that he weakened Jesus for 39 days. And you know that the devil came on the 40th day and he, Jesus, the devil saw Jesus in his weakened state and thought that he could defeat him. And he thought that maybe Jesus would serve him because of his weakness, not eating or drinking for 40 days. He, if you will, he suckered him into the wilderness. But he didn't sucker the devil into the wilderness to defeat Jesus. He suckered him into the wilderness for Jesus to defeat him. And the Bible says, uh, the book of Luke says that Jesus went into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit, but he left in the power of the Spirit. And I believe that the, the Lord has like, hey, have you considered my servant? And what the Lord has done, I feel like you're in a weakened state because when you're weak, he's strong. And two things are happening. First of all, the Lord's gonna defeat the enemy on your behalf without your, without your involvement to show you that when you're weak, he's strong. The second thing is that you're gonna leave this season and the season's gonna end in May and you're gonna leave this season in the power of the Spirit. And what's gonna happen is snakes are gonna show up in other people's life and you'll be like, I know how to defeat those. Yes. And you're gonna lose your fear of snakes 
because those snakes crawled over you, they bit you, but you were inoculated from it because the blood of Christ does not, re, not, does not is, is impervious to the poison of snakes. And you're gonna be like, you can't scare me because I'm inoculated from you. And I believe that that, it's a metaphor, you get all this right. And, and, and I believe that you're gonna lose your fear of snakes. I'm gonna tell you that I was demonized for three and a half years. This is my story. This is actually my story. And it was in the del my own personal deliverance that I lost fear of demonic spirits, of people being demonized, because when I got free, I realized if I could get free, anyone can get free. And so this, these dreams, these harassing dreams, the Lord is saying, come and see my daughters. But what's gonna happen is, is that he's coming, but you're gonna crush his head. You're gonna crush his head. And the most important thing isn't your victory. The most important thing is you're gonna lose, you are gonna lose fear of snakes. You're gonna lose fear of demon, demonized people. You're gonna lose fear. Your warfare is gonna mean a totally different thing to you. Warfare is gonna be the joy of the Lord is my strength. I, I get to laugh in the face of crazy people. So I just unleash you in Jesus' name. That's a good word. Uh, I have this, uh, okay, I have, I'm gonna change. Uh, um, I want kids, we had a whole bunch of kids that got baptized tonight. If you're in the room, would you stand up? While you guys were getting baptized, I just had this prophetic thing happen to me. There was a bunch of them. Is there more here tonight? They're probably in bed. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah and, uh, in fact, why don't all the children stand up? Like just the children, just have the children stand up. Children stand up. Like 12 and under would be great. Just stand up. Yes, yeah, stand yeah. How old are you? That's good enough. I mean, who needs math? This is new math, this is new math. Yeah, you can stand up. If you consider yourself a child, stand up. And online, stand no, 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 no. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I saw, I, I, I wrote this down in the middle of worship. A generation that has endured a 21st century genocide. You survived abortion, you overcame suicide, you pushed through indoctrination camps, you got free from sexual perversion, and you become a revolutionary, and now it's time for you to have a deliverance anointing. So if you're a kid, I want you to put your hands out. If you're watching your own on, online campus, would you just do the same? If it's, if it's appropriate, just stand up in your home or wherever you're at and just put your hands out like this, like this. Or yeah, why don't you just put them over your head? That's even better. Okay, I'm gonna pray for you right now, but I'm gonna give you something. I'm gonna give you something and let it be according to your faith. I'm gonna give you something that you didn't come with tonight. Now, remember that whenever God gives you a gift, it comes with responsibility, right? Because whom God, you know, who's given much is, requires much, right? So who much is given, much is required. So I, I, I'm gonna release an anointing on you for freeing people. And that means that people who need freedom are gonna to come to you, so don't complain about it. And God's gonna free, he's gonna free people through children. Listen, th this, th there is a demonic plot, and I'm mommy. oh, he's a conspiratist. There is a demonic plot there's a demonic plot to take out Generation Z. There is, you can see it. In fact, actually about 20% of them aren't even here with us anymore because they've been aborted. But the Lord is raising up a deliverer, so to speak, a deliverance generation out of Generation Z. You remember when Moses was sent to be a deliverer that the Pharaoh killed all the firstborn children? When Jesus was coming, was born, they killed the firstborn male children. And the enemy is trying to wipe out a generation because he knows this is the generation of reformation. So extend your hands to these children. Lord, we release right now the power of God. We pray for the power of God to visit them in the night. 
We pray that it would walk them to school in the morning. We pray they would have angel visitations. We pray that they would see angels, that they would know their angel. As Daniel had an angel that talked to him, that told him his name, Lord, and I, I pray that the, you said that every child has an angel, and you said it would be better for you to never be born or a millstone to be put around your neck and be thrown in the depths of the sea. It'd be better for that to happen to you than to offend one of these children. And so, Lord, I pray that they would be arrows, arrows in the hands of warriors, that they would be first to trouble, and that, tr that, Lord, that they would trouble the enemy, that this generation, I, I, saw, I, I saw you stand up in, in school and say, no, that's not the way it is. <laughs> that's not the way it is. I wanna tell you about this encounter I had, keep, keep this up. Before I knew the Lord, I was in a philosophy class because it was required of me. I, was, I think I was in about, uh, I think I was a junior, sophomore or junior, did not know God. I'd had an encounter with God when I was 15, but I did not know God. All I knew that his name was Jesus because the encounter said my name is Jesus Christ. My philosophy teacher was a, he was a, he was a evangelist for atheism. And he was telling us there, there is no God and here's, and here's Freud and we're learning all this stuff about philosophy and, and, and about psychology. And I'm sitting there and I'm like the goof off in the class. Like I, I barely passed high school. I couldn't read in high school. So something happened and I stood up in class and I began to give an intellectual exhortation on why there was a God who created the earth. It went on for five minutes. The students looked at me, the professor went totally silent. The students looked at me, stood and clapped. I walked out of that class and I'm like, I have no idea how that happened. And the Lord literally took over my body and he spoke with my voice to the professor. It happened one other time in my English class when the English teacher was talking about why there was no God. And I stood up and I gave her an exhortation. And I mean, it was a, like a science exhortation. I had no idea what I was saying. And I believe that you are gonna have that experience. That you're gonna turn a generation from atheism to creationists, that you're gonna turn a generation, that God's gonna give you a brilliant mind, he's gonna give you a spirit of revelation, you're gonna know things you shouldn't know, you're gonna know things that no one ever taught you, no one ever told you, that the Holy Spirit himself is gonna be your teacher, your guide, your anointed one, you're gonna, he's gonna be your best friend, he's gonna to go to school with you, he's gonna tell you in class, stand up now, and he's gonna give you the power and the grace, and he's like, when you, and you're like, I don't know what to say, and he's gonna tell you, when you stand, you'll have something to say. And I believe that he's given you courage, but he's also given you grace and mercy. And, and people are gonna go, that's amazing. They're not gonna go, I reject you. They're gonna go, can I follow you? And I bless you in Jesus' name. That's a good word. Jesus is healing PTSD. And um, war veterans, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call these all out. War veterans, rape victims, someone was locked in a trunk in like a kidnapping. Uh, and there was a, uh, also a house invasion, and then there were some folks that were involved in a school shooting. I don't mean you were a part of the shooting, I mean you were there. Um, if you're in the room, would you stand, if that's you? If you're in the room, would you stand? Same thing on, on, on our online campus. If you're online, would you stand? Um, did the lock in the trunk thing mean anything to someone in here? I saw this vivid vision during worship that somebody was locked in a trunk as if, I don't know, if kidnapping or what it was. Okay, it's okay. Is that you? Okay. Okay. Okay, good, bad, but good. Good that God's transforming you right now. Okay, um, house invasion. Did anyone have a house invasion? Was that you? Okay. Uh, was anyone in the room involved in a school shooting? There was a school shooting where you were there. Would you raise your hand if that was you? 
Okay, we're there. Okay. Um, school shooting house invasion. I, I won't ask for rape victims. I, I don't. I don't want. I don't want you to feel. Uh, is there any uh, war vets in here that you're still struggling with that? I want to. Aren't you guys thankful for our our veterans? Thank you, Lord. Okay. Extend your hands to these folks right here. We break the power of yesterday. Paul Philippians said, forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we break the power of fear that has attached itself to our friends after even the incident and continues to torment them. And I, I break the spirit, the spirit of PTSD. I break the spirit of PTSD in Jesus' name. That this rape, that this lock in the trunk thing, that this home invasion, that just so many other things. Our veterans who went off to protect our countries and, and came back and still live in the war. Lord, we just break the pattern of that right now in Jesus' name. And we say that those demons they brought back from war, we say you can go to hell right now in Jesus' name. And we release freedom in you in the name of Jesus. And we say that the peace of God that crushes Satan under your feet shall be, shall guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And I, 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 right now I just see this picture of uh, the thing that normally happens that triggers you and I see you looking at that trigger and going, wow, that's weird, there's no pain. Well, I had no anxiety. I didn't break out in sweats. I didn't have a panic attack. I, and, I, I, and I believe that the Lord is gonna give you dreams to confirm that he has poured cold water on the fires of affliction in your life, in Jesus' name, and that he has settled this and solved this, that he has completely freed you, and that he has completely restored you in Jesus' name, yeah. I just release a river. Not only would you be free, but you would be a freedom fighter for others. Yes. Yes. That you would be like, hey, my testimony is I used to have PT PTSD so bad. I had night terrors and I had panic attacks. I had my uncontrolled thoughts and the Lord delivered me in one night and he can do that for you too. And I bless that in you in Jesus' name. And on our online campus too, we bless you in Jesus' name. And we say freedom to you in Jesus' name, that you, that Christ died for freedom, that you could be set free and that you would go free, that you would live in the joy of the Lord. I release the joy of the Lord to each of you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can sit down. Um, you're, you're right there in black. Could you stand up? What's your name? You don't know your name? Yes, Christopher. Oh, hi. <laughs> That's a good name. I hope you're living up to it. <laughs> the Lord's going to remove doubt from you. You're going to have a touch his hands, touch his side experience as I speak to you right now. And, and because the Lord has called you to be a man that carries a gift of faith. And you're going to be leader of God's people. And you're going to be like one of the 33 mighty men who when everyone else defected, they stood on the lentils. This one guy, he stood on the lentils and defeated it from morning till night until the sword, till his hand clung to the sword, meaning that his hand and the sword became one. And the hand and the sword in your life is gonna become one. That the sword of the spirit is gonna be so strong in your life that not only can you defend yourself, but you can defend your flock. And the Lord says, I'm gonna give you a flock. And this flock, you're gonna love this flock. You're gonna defend this flock from the wolves. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get ticks off out of this flock. You're gonna get, you know, splinters and 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 and, and uh, you know thistles. And the Lord said, I'm gonna give you a ministry of caring for the flock in such a way that people come to study how you got your flock healthy. And the Lord said, the first part of the flock I'm gonna give you, they are really sick. I'm gonna give you sick people. I'm gonna give you depressed people. I'm gonna give you despised people. I'm gonna give you in debt people. And you'd be like, Lord, this isn't a church. This is a hospital. And the Lord said, you're gonna turn that hospital into a church. It's gonna be a beautiful church. 
and their families are gonna to begin to come. And their families, many of them aren't broken, many of them are wealthy, many of them are healthy. And, and the Lord's like, uh, your, your job, you're not gonna build a hospital, you're just gonna start a hospital so that you can have a church. You're gonna write a book about it too. It's gonna be something that's gonna have the word hospital in it, like how I took from hospital and I built the church. So I bless what God's doing in you. And are you guys friends? Because he's going to be your help. He's going to be a helper. Because he's an evangelist. He's going to get them there, and you're going to get them well. Is there a David right here somewhere? Right here. Is there someone named David right here? There you go. That's good. Does your last name start with an R? What is your middle name? What's your last name? Wild. Eh, wild? Wild. <laughs> Spell it. W-E-I-L. Oh, close. And, and, and what's your middle name? Philip. Huh, that's a good name too. I, I, I just, I pray for a blessing on your life. Are you married? You will soon. Hey, I didn't say who to. A woman, though. I see uh, the Lord giving you this beautiful marriage. Like, like a romance novel marriage. Like what you're afraid of ain't going to happen. The Lord's going to give you this most wonderful woman. She's going to love you. She's going to be... She's gonna be your greatest fan. She's gonna be like, David, you, I, am, I adore you. It's gonna be like Song of Solomon. Now, I don't mean there's never gonna be a problem, but I mean, she's gonna be so taken by you. She's gonna think you're better looking than me. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, it's hard to believe. But there is a anointing on the two of you that is like, you're not complete without her, and she's not complete without you. But what the Lord, I saw the word power couple written over you. And I feel like there is this uh, kind of family you're gonna build that is your children are gonna carry an, an anointing for government and, and for wealth. And I see a wealth culture coming out of you. And I see this woman is like, she's like a princess. And when you see her, you're gonna say, I'm not qualified to date this woman. And the Lord's like, yeah, you're the only one who doesn't know that you're qualified to date this woman. Wow. And she's gonna pull you up and she's gonna remind you of who you are and she's gonna dress you in the robes of kings. And you're gonna be like, in three years after you're married, you're gonna be like, now I deserve her, but I didn't when I married her. But she sees something in you that you don't see in you. And that's what's gonna be beautiful to you. Is there a Richard right here? Is there a Richard? Where? Yeah, okay, is there a Richard right here? Someone wanna change their name? Hmm. Richard. Well, that's my middle name. What's your middle name? Richard. Stand up. Dude, if he was older, he'd stood up and said, that's his first name. <laughs> Richard, I gave you a word already about what's happening in your life. But the Lord, I saw you studying the Bible. And I saw the Bible coming alive to you. And I saw it going from a boring dead book to a video. Like I saw like a video, like the movie, like, like the Bible turned into this documentary, beautiful, amazing story. And you learn the Bible through this, these videos that the Lord's showing you, like in the spirit. Like I saw you reading a story and all of a sudden it turned into a video. I saw you, like it's an example. I saw you like reading the story of David and Goliath and all of a sudden it wasn't, you weren't reading anymore. You were seeing it like in a vision. And then when you teach people, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, this guy's the best storyteller I've ever heard. It's like he was, like he watched the story. And the Lord has given you a spirit of revelation. 
And, this, and also, when you, uh, you're gonna read the book of Ephesians and the book of Revelation, and, what, and the Lord's gonna unlock mysteries that humans have yet to see. And, and um, by the way, this is scriptural. In, Revel, uh, in Ephesians chapter one, he said, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, said, I pray that God would give you a spirit of revelation and wisdom. And so I, I pray that you would take the first chapter of Ephesians and that you would memorize that chapter. Because that chapter is gonna be the door that opens the rest of the book to you because you're gonna pray and the Lord's gonna open up the book of Ephesians to you. Like you're gonna be famous in your 40s for teaching the book of Ephesians because you're gonna teach it as a man who has authority. And so I bless what God's doing in you and through you. And um, that's a good word. Are you his dad? Oh, good. Is your name Richard? Well, you should receive the same word. For me. I mean it sincerely. And, and just let it happen with him. Like, I know, this your dad to dad, just like, don't do anything about what I just said in his life. Just let it happen. Just let it happen. That's a good word right there. Is there someone over here, like your name's like, it, it's, it's not, it's maybe Mary in English, but it's like Marta or something? Huh? What's your name? My second name is Martha. Martha? Yeah, my second Yeah, that's good. What's your first name? Karen, that'll do. <laughs> I saw you riding a white horse and I asked the Lord what it meant and he said that, first of all, he's given you a spirit of adventure. He's taken away your fear of horses. It's a metaphor. He's taken away your fear of horses and uh, that your purity is powerful. That you are riding the horse of your purity and that the Lord is opening up doors and that a great adventure is gonna happen because not only are you, do you have a pure life, but the Lord's gonna open the door so that you are perpetuating purity, that you are speaking about purity, that you're calling a generation to purity. That, that and um, come here right here, come right here. Sorry, I didn't mean it just like that. Please come right here, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna take away your fear of people. Lord, I break the power of fear of man, that she could stand in a crowd and have no fear, that even while she's preparing to talk, she would be like, this is gonna be so good. I am so good at this, Lord. You've anointed me to be so good at this. And I bless this woman that she'd be a prophet to her generation and that all the things that she has wished for and hoped for would be hers. And I pray that the Lord would give you a vision of talking to a generation in Jesus' name, in stadiums and under a bridge, every place that the Lord would send you, in Jesus' name, I release that to you. Thank you, Lord, that's a good word. You can sit down, you're beautiful. Can I give you a hug? Yes. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Why are you standing? You're, you're what? My name's Mary too. It is? Yeah. Is it Mary too or Mary? <laughs> <laughs> just to be on this being a little funny, sorry. Mm, I, um, thank you, Lord. Come right here and let me pray for you. Don't be afraid. Thank you, Lord. I just pray for the fire of God to be on you. I pray for a reformation to come out of you. I just see you in a very traditional church and people were on the ground laughing. <laughs> and I see you saying to yourself, Lord, not, not right now. <laughs> Lord, please, please, Lord, not right now. And like you just leak wherever you go and I saw you, uh, for some reason, I don't know if it's your education or something that you do for a uh, vocation, but it's given you a place, you know, a group of people who are very staunch, like I would say boring. <laughs> like they live out of their heads. 
And the Lord just, when you start talking, even though you're doing like a very intellectual conversation, like Holy Spirit falls on them. And you're like embarrassed. You're like, oh Lord, no, not please. And you're like pleading with the Lord, like, Lord, when I go do it, these people, please don't like, please don't fall on them like that, Lord. And they, the Lord falls on them. Gold dust, all the things that are weird follow you. Even though you're doing very intellectual things, like crazy stuff falls on people. And, and people are like, she's not making that happen. She doesn't even talk about it. But the Lord flows out of you like a river. And I release right now in Jesus' name this river that wouldn't come out of your mouth, it would come out of your belly. In Jesus' name, I'll release a river coming out of your belly. Oh, stay right here. I pray in Jesus' name that it would flow to the intellectual. It flowed to the person who said, I don't believe in that, that's never gonna happen to me. And I pray that you would be a sign and a wonder, that you would be a door, a door, a door to miracles, to mystics, and to manifestations. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. That's a good, that's a good word. Our Lord says three days. It's going to happen in three days. I don't know what that means, but it's going to happen in three days. I don't know why you need to know that, but yeah. Lots of people call you mom, but lots of people are going to call you pastor. What's your name? Maria. Maria. Where are you from? He doesn't believe in female preachers? <laughs> what could we do about that? <laughs> oh, Lord, I, I just pray for her to be a problem. Yeah. I pray she'd be so anointed yes, yeah. that she would wreck his yes. theology. In Jesus' name, Lord, I just yes. pray. Are, are you Mexican? No, I'm from Ecuador. Ecuador. I've been to Ecuador. You know, there's a great, I prophesied that there would be a woman's movement coming out of Ecuador. You could, I put it in the, uh, in the Fashion the Rain book. I didn't say what country it is, but it was Ecuador. And I pray, yes, we pray. I have the book. You do? You should read it. It's a very good book. Lord, I pray for her to be a catalyst to the Ecuadorian revival in Jesus' name. That that woman's movement that you said that would, wouldn't be a feminist movement, but it'd be a matriarchal movement. Lord, I pray that would spring out of her belly in Jesus' name. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I pray that she would cause her pastor such good problems. Good problems. I see your pastor talking to his wife and going, I don't know about Maria. She's just like, like she's a good teacher, but she's not supposed to teach in our church. And Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just anoint her in a way that causes people to change their minds about Ecuadorian women. In Jesus' name, that there would be a matriarchal movement through Ecuador. In Jesus' name. That's a good word. Thank you, Lord. What time are we supposed to be done? A while ago. Or any time. No, no, no. It, it doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't? <laughs> Listen, you don't want to tell a mechanic, you don't want to tell a mechanic, I don't care how much it costs. You don't want to tell a carpenter, I don't care how long it takes. And you don't want to tell a preacher, just in whenever you feel like it. That's a bad plan. You're right there, you're, yeah, you got no, got no pants on. Yeah. Come on, George, stand up. George is a professional basketball player. Mm -hmm. But he is anointed shepherd. This man, like this isn't even a prophecy. This man is an anointed shepherd. I, I pray for you to come in to your shepherding now. Like David was first a warrior and then he became a king and he was always a shepherd. 
And I, I just pray for the shepherd that's in you to attract people around you. And I see uh, young people around you. I know you coach our basketball teams and all of that, but I see young people around you and I see you wrapping your arms around hundreds of young people. Like there's something in you that says, my flock will be safe from this generation. And I see you loving them. I see you doing outdoor things. Like I see you like doing campfires and like I see like the, uh, like I see a new scouts movement coming out of you, wow. girls and boy scouts. I see the Lord's gonna resurrect these. Um, you, you, this is the truth, by the way, you should write this down. The Lord's gonna resurrect the girl scouts and the boy scouts yes. in a way that they are girl scouts and boy scouts. Yes going to re revive them. And I saw you uh, a part of a movement to restore the, you know, taking guys on adventures, taking women on adventures, taking girls, um, mothers and, and, uh, and, and women, taking young girls and teaching girls how to be women, teaching boys how to be men. This is a movement that's going to rise. Like, I, I'm telling you, like, out of this, right now we're in the war zone. This, I can see this right now. Like we're in a war zone and we're warring against something, but we're gonna shift and the strategy is gonna change from warring to building. Amen. And we're gonna build something beautiful that can't be spoken against because it's gonna destroy the suicide spirit that's on this generation. It's gonna destroy this, the, the murdering, killing, shooting spirit. It's gonna, it's gonna restore identity back to women and men it's going gonna, it's gonna to restore the family. And there is a whole thing about like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. I don't know if it's going to be called Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, by the way. I mean, it's going to be, I say that to remind us of what we had, you know, 100 years ago and 50 years ago. And, I, and somehow you're going to be a part of the restoration of this movement to teach boys how to be men, to teach girls how to be women. And by the way, the Lord trusts you with his women because of the way you've managed your inner world in the cesspool of the NBA. And so I bless you in that, in Jesus' name. You should know that the Lord loves you and he trusts you. You should know that. You should really know that. He loves you and he trusts you. So you, you, you don't be a wallflower. It's not good for you. It's not who you are. You have a voice for a reason. The Lord trusts you. Mm -hmm. And the Lord's giving you a mind. What's your name? Ariel. Ariel? The Lord's giving you a mind. Like, like a brilliant mind. And sometimes I saw you say, you know, I don't know, I'm just I have a hard time getting out of my head. And it's like, you're not supposed to get out of your head. The Lord's giving you a brilliant mind. He's giving, in fact, the Lord wants to open up your mind to another level of thinking. And he wants to educate you in the courts of the king. Like Daniel had to be educated to, be, uh, to serve Nebuchadnezzar, he had to be educated in the court of a king. Uh, Moses had to be, he had to be, you want to, are you doing something to me? Just kidding. And, and Moses, Moses had to be raised by a king so he could be a king. And the Lord says that even though Moses was raised by Pharaoh, he still learned how to be a king. Even though Daniel was raised in Nebuchadnezzar's courts, he still learned the laws of leadership. Like, um, what I'm getting at is, even before Moses knew God, God knew Moses. Sometimes we think our BC life, before Christ's life, was kind of a waste. But God goes, no, I was already training you for your divine purpose. Before you knew me, I already knew your purpose. And I believe that the Lord's been training you since you were a little boy. And I see these, uh, all these calculations on a, on a whiteboard, like all these calculations, like, I don't know if it's, it's, like I see math calculations, but I think it's a metaphor for this strategically brilliant mind. And I see you sitting with great leaders and they're going like, this is the way forward. And you're like, no, that doesn't add up. It's this and this and this and this. And you can see, like you can, you, like I saw these uh, algebraic equations like popping into your mind when people are saying, well, this is the way it ought to be. And you're like, no, that, that doesn't add up. And you can kind of like see 
life circumstances in algebraic equations go, no, that doesn't come to the answer. And I feel like I saw you like in the planning department, but not like planning a city where things go kind of thing, but like a strategic plan for an entire city or an entire nation. And so I'm blessed what God's doing in you. I pray for him to open the uh, uh, Ephesians 3 to you, the manifold wisdom of God. Uh, would be made known through the church to principalities and powers. And I just release that to you in Jesus' name, that you would, even tonight, you would have a dream about your mind. I pray that you would have a dream about your mind. I saw the Lord take the top off of your head and he rewired it. Uh, he rewired your mind. I, that's crazy. That's not, can't happen, but... But you know, it's, I don't know, this stuff is crazy. I, I just pray for the Lord to rewire your mind for more productivity and for more capacity. In Jesus' name, I release that. You're gonna be like God's answer to AI. Wow. Amen. Amen. We release that to you too, to you and to you and to you. If there's a... Uh, um, if there's, if there's someone in here that doesn't know the Lord, would you stand up? I have a word for you. You know the Lord. Would you just stand up? I have a word for you. Some of you are like, I, I don't know him very well. <laughs> do you not know the Lord? I don't, no, are you being funny or do you not know the Lord? I'm not trying to embarrass you. Not being funny. Hmm. I, I saw your heart like uh, someone dropped a mirror and broke it. And I saw the Lord like Humpty Dumpty, like who can put this back together again? And I saw the le Lord lean over and pick up all the pieces of the mirror. And he, um, and as he picked them up, they, um, like liquefied and, and became one. Uh, but, but not the mirror you were looking in. Because the mirror you were looking in was like a funhouse mirror. And the Lord said, I'm gonna be your mirror and I'm going to mirror back the way I see you. And the Lord is rewriting your story. He's rewriting your story and he's forgiven you. He's forgiven you for the thing you have never been able to forgive yourself for. And so I release to you forgiveness and I release a new identity. And when people see you two months from now, they're like, who is she and where did she go? And the Lord is that picture you see of yourself that's always like haunting. Like you're gonna look again and like, it's not, it's a completely different picture. And that picture was taken with the camera that was intentionally to distort you. Wow. And I saw the Lord surround you with this beautiful music and he dressed you in this beautiful uh, like uh, gown and he, he's inviting you into this new place. And I saw freedom coming to you and I saw you sleeping all night and I saw no anxiety and I saw you wake up tomorrow morning going, man, that crazy prophet's right. Like, I feel so peaceful. <laughs> like, I, don't, I, I knew he was good looking, but I didn't know he's accurate. <laughs> I'm being a little funny, but I see your mornings. I saw you rising with hope tomorrow morning. I saw you, I saw depression and anxiety and insomnia and uh, this weird body thing that happens with you that they can't figure out. I saw that all go away. And I saw peace coming into you, health coming into you. I even saw you eating differently and sleeping differently. And I believe that this is a season where the Lord has taken, like he's become your physician. The Lord's become your psychologist, your physician, your counselor, and your trainer. And so I bless what's in you in Jesus' name. And I'd love for you just to come up when we're done here and maybe you can come up and talk to one of the gals. That'd be great. Um, amen. Why don't you all stand? Let me just pray for you. Leslie's gonna stay tonight because there's prophetic ministry on her and... She's a mother and she said, I wouldn't want anyone to leave without a prophetic word, so I will stay. 
Oh, she said she has one. Jesus loves you. <laughs> but I'm just going to pray for you right now. I feel so strong tonight that there's like a Holy Spirit, something happening. You know, when Moses, uh, he was encountering God in the tent of meeting. You remember the story? And um, in Exodus 32. But in Exodus 33, Moses asked this question of God. Will you go with us? Because before that, well, the connotation is, God, I love being in the tent, but I actually need you out of the tent. <laughs> I love meeting you in the tent, but what's happening in the tent, I actually kind of need you, I need that to happen out of the tent. Will you go with us? So when Moses is talking to God about going with him, he's not talking about like, gosh, I hope you're with us. He's like, hey, I go in the tent and crazy things happen where I feel connected, you talk to me. But the challenge is, is I leave the tent and I actually need you when I'm not in the tent more than I need you when I'm in the tent. So will you go with us? Can I have those kind of, can I have this kind of relationship with you that when I'm not in the tent, I am confident that you're with me. And I just want to pray this right now. Exodus 33 over you, that God would go with you. I don't mean like, oh, God's with me. I don't mean that. I mean that what's happening tonight to you or in your special zone, that when you leave here, it would increase. When you go to work tomorrow, when you go to school, whatever you're doing tomorrow, you'll be like, man, that's something crazy. I feel so anointed. It's like, I just release the tent of meeting when there's no tent for you in Jesus' name. Why don't you say, I receive that. God bless you. Happy Easter. One more time, and just honor him. Thank you, Chris, for your word. And um, we just want to bless the online stream as well. So why don't you just turn your hands to the online stream. So God, I just thank you so much. We just speak resurrection, life, and power over every single person watching right now, God. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would fill you afresh. And Lord, we just say blessings and peace be with you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, you guys. Happy Easter. He is risen. And um, if we could get some help with stacking the chairs, we would so appreciate that. Um, see you guys next week.